Now this is why we see, when we look out into the world, we see that there are jihad groups that call themselves jihad groups. They take the name Islamic Jihad. They take the names that show they are the party of Allah, His Allah. They, are very, they take various names that indicate that this is the program that they are following. And they're found in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Kashmir, in Nigeria, in Chechnya, in the Balkans, in uh, Western Europe, in England. Uh, there are many, many such groups all around the world. And uh, they all are, by their own explanation, following out this idea that they are fighting ultimately not because of political grievances that they have against America or against Israel, although such grievances that they do have are indeed something that they have recourse to and they're very useful recruiting tools among the larger aggregate of peaceful Muslims. But at the same time, they emphasize that they are fighting according to and in accordance with these traditional teachings that mandate that non-Muslims have no right to, we have to, to, to hold political power, and that the Muslims have the responsibility to fight against them until they pay this tax, which is yet, and feel themselves subdued. Now, there are various distinctions that have to be made here, and one of them is that according to this manual of Islamic law, and according to the other schools of Islamic jurisprudence that are in agreement with the Shafi'is on this question, the uh, offensive jihad, the jihad that is, is designed to go and take the fight to the unbelievers and to make war against non-Muslim polities in order to establish the hegemony of the Islamic State, that can only be done by the, that can only be declared, that can only be begun by the caliph. The caliph was the successor of Muhammad among Sunni Muslims, the successor of Muhammad as the leader of the Islamic community worldwide. Now, by the early part of the 20th century, the caliphate was essentially a figurehead. The, the caliph was a figurehead. The caliphate was essentially an empty office it, involving the, uh, the spiritual, political, and military leadership of the Islamic community. But by the early 20th century, it was more of a historical memory than a genuine reality. And in 1924, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the founder of secular Turkey, actually abolished the caliphate which is a real world historical event, one of the most important events in history, as a matter of fact. It would be like going into Rome, some army going into Rome, and saying there's no more pope, no more papacy, it's all over. The repercussions that would be in the world would be very large and would be uh, probably unimaginable for us. And they are, we are still in the post-caliphate period. We are still in living in the world in which the repercussions of the abolition of the caliphate are being felt. And the reason for that is, is because groups like the Muslim Brotherhood that I mentioned before, founded in 1928 in Egypt, founded four years after the abolition of the Caliphate, were founded in direct response to that abolition in order to reassert the prerogatives of political Islam and ultimately to restore that Caliphate as not as a, as a, as a symbolic office or as some sort of a, uh, a, a, figure, a figurehead, an empty suit, but rather as a real, viable, supranational fount of unity for the Muslims that would enable them once again to wage offensive jihad against non-Islamic states. The restoration of the caliphate is a fundamental aspect of the program of the Muslim Brotherhood, as well as its offshoots like Hamas in the, the, the Palestinian areas and uh, Al-Qaeda, which is pretty much everywhere around the world at this point. Um, the restoration of the caliphate is very dear to the heart of Islamic jihadists worldwide. But in its absence, in the absence of the caliph, jihad does not go away. According to Islamic jurisprudence, the defensive jihad remains and does not need to be called by any overarching supranational authority. The offensive jihad is the province of the caliph. But in the absence of the caliphate, the Muslims have an obligation to wage jihad in a defensive manner whenever or wherever an Islamic land is attacked. Jihad, in other words, is fard kifaya, which is an obligation upon the community as a whole. And so if he's doing it over here, then I don't have to over here because he's taking care of it, he's discharging the obligation on the community's behalf. However, 
When a Muslim land is attacked, or is considered to have been attacked, then jihad becomes part ayn, which is an obligation upon every individual Muslim to aid in some way, either by active fighting in a hot war, or financially, or by propagandizing, or in some way to aid in the defense of jihad. So every jihad since 1924 has been defensive, including, according to Osama bin Laden, the, uh, the t t destruction of the Twin Towers on 9-11. And according to the jihadis in England who uh, blew up the subways on July 7th, 2005, and the Madrid bombings of March 11th, 2004, the Bali bombings, all these were ascribed by those who perpetrated them and by those who supported those who perpetrated them. All these were, were explained as defensive actions in a war that they considered to be ongoing with the unbelievers. No. What is the objective of the war? When is there going to be a peace treaty? When is there going to be an end? Well, the answer to that, I'm sorry to tell you, is essentially never. Because uh, in Islamic theology and law, the jihad continues essentially until the end times. And then in the end times, depending on whether you go to Sunni or Shiite sources, how it all unfolds is a little bit different. But the, the ultimate uh, outcome is the same, that the world is entirely Islamized, and then peace reigns over the world. But until then, Jihad remains a general obligation upon the Islamic community. Now, there are, of course, and there have been in history, successful jihads that have been waged against non-Muslim states, and those states have been conquered. And then what happens? As I told you, Islam forbids forced conversion. Now, of course, every law is broken and can be broken, and that goes for Islamic law as well as non-Islamic law, and so there have been forced conversions, but nonetheless, it is not the general practice. It is something that is forbidden. What is prescribed for non-Muslims when they are conquered and they accept the rule of the Muslims is in line with chapter 9, verse 29 of the Quran, to which I, uh, which I quoted earlier to you, that they have to pay the jizya, this tax, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. In other words, they are denied the quality of rights uh, with the Muslims. There is no uh, majority Muslim state anywhere in the world, not even secular Turkey, where non-Muslims enjoy absolute, full, and total equality of rights with Muslims. Now, even though Islamic law is not fully enforced in any of those countries today, except Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Iran, uh, nonetheless, these laws remain something that are considered that is considered current, especially by those who take Islamic jurisprudence very seriously, and. They remain a cultural memory, a kind of cultural hangover, as it were. In other words, uh, people consider that this is the way things ought to be ordered, and so they tend to reinforce these principles when given the opportunity. And so the laws for the non-Muslim subjects, who notice the protected people, or the Zumis, the Dinis, uh, they are considered to have rebelled against, to be renegades against the truth of Islam and the reality of Muhammad as a prophet. And the Quran promises that they will suffer in this world as well as the next for that rejection and rebellion. And so they have to be made to feel subdued in the Islamic state. That is a religious responsibility coming from the presuppositions in Islamic theology that say that they have rejected this truth and consequently they have to feel that rejection as a consequence, as they have to feel deprivations, they have to feel suffering as a consequence of their rebellion against God. And so the non-Muslim subjects of the Islamic State, and I quote, are obliged to comply with Islamic rules that pertain to the safety and indemnity of life, reputation, and property, which are the goals, the safeguard of which are some of the primary goals of Islamic law in general. And so they are distinguished from Muslims in dress, and that was because uh, a Muslim is not to greet a non-Muslim with the traditional Islamic greeting, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. A uh, Muslim to, to a non-Muslim is supposed to say, peace be upon those who are rightly guided, in other words, peace be on us, but not on you. 